This is software engineering the VMS way, writing great code that survives hypes, cutbacks, and takeovers, as recorded during the 2016 OpenVMS bootcamp in Nashua. A little bit about myself for those who don't know me. Um, I'm one of the software engineers at VMS Software. I guess it's safe to say I'm a bit of an expert when it comes to the x86 architecture as well as the C and C++ programming languages. I'm working mainly on the x86 board, but I also got drafted into doing Java 8. And before I joined VSI, I developed some emulators for the alpha architecture, and I did a lot of consulting work with various uh, Industry, well, around various industries that involve OpenVMS. So some of my other interests are collecting old hardware, and particularly collecting large old hardware, stuff like mini supercomputers from the 1980s, for example. Um, and I like to collect really good wine. So three years ago, my wife and I built or bought a 200-year-old farmhouse that accommodates both those hobbies very well. And it is my birthday today, indeed. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> so, a little introduction. And I'm going to introduce this guy. This is a fellow that I'll refer to as the beard, because this is sort of the closest um, stock picture I could find to him. And um, this guy came up to Colin and me, Colin Butcher, probably most of you know him, after a session at one of the Dutch technical update days years ago. I think this was 2008, 2009, something like that. And this guy wanted to talk to us about this new software development paradigm he was working on. And this guy was really taking rapid application development and developing in the cloud up to the next level. What he was describing to us is there's this whole library of routines that have been created by various people when you write a routine, you put a description on it, and you put it out in the cloud. And then our software is able to take a description of the problem you have and it goes off and it finds all these bits of codes that have somewhat matching descriptions. It puts them all together and voila, you have an application and you don't need to worry about any of this tedious design work that you were just taught, telling us about in your session. So Colin and I look at each other and we start trying to educate this man about some of the kinds of software projects that we were involved in. Stuff like nuclear power control systems, railroad control systems, um, Colin's involvement in the NHS blood transfusion systems. And we explained that we put a lot of thought and detail into these designs before we start coding anything because these are mission critical things and sometimes the reason we do it is because otherwise people get killed. And as we're explaining this to him, his eyes light up and we think he's getting it. But when we're done talking, he says, great, that means you really see the value in not having to do that anymore. At which point we started looking for a polite way to end the conversation and get out of the room. And the one thing that the conversation did, and um, I'm exaggerating only a little bit, this conversation did was it got my mind thinking. And this may be very, a very extreme and a very um, almost ridiculous example, but a lot of modern software engineering is very much like that. Go out on the internet, find little bits and pieces of code and puzzle them together, put a little glue in it, and it might work. Um, so that got me thinking, what if my two boys end up wanting to be software developers? What will their coding be like? Are they going to enjoy 
making a good design and then implementing it? Or are they going to be the kind of coders who go and hack away at something and then hopefully it works and if it doesn't they try again and if not they give up and move on to another project? I don't know. So I was thinking who would be the best people to ask? And I figured that these guys knew a thing or two about how to properly design something. Um, so in 2009 and 2010, I started out sending emails to some of the VMS engineers that I knew. Uh, Richard probably remembers receiving my email and some other here in the room may. And I basically started asking them all these questions about what was the engineering process like? What was the team like? How did you make sure that everything was documented properly? And um, I got some responses, and based on those responses, I had more questions, so I asked for more details. Um, I also read Digital Software Engineering Manual, the edition from 1988, I believe. And then I tried to implement some of the stuff that I was learning from these engineers and from this manual in my own software development processes as I was developing these emulators. So in 2011-2012, I finally got around to taking all the input I had gotten from all these engineers and putting that in writing, sort of editing their thoughts into like a somewhat consistent document. I never published it. I published, finally published it on my website around 2014. Um, and now I've incorporated into that also some of my first-hand experiences being part of a team. Um, and because of that, I'm now much more comfortable discussing this because I've now experienced some of this firsthand. So this presentation is a tribute to the VMS engineers all the way back to 1976 up to today who have really, I think, done a very good job designing software the way you're supposed to do it if the stuff you're working on is really critical to you. So with that, I'm going to go over several subjects that I think are instrumental in putting together good engineering practices. So I'll start with team and I've got some quotes on, on, on these introduction slides, and I quite like the one about the gr a group being a bunch of people in an elevator, and a team is also a bunch of people in an elevator, but now the elevator is broken. The elevator is broken, and you need to get out. That's a good way to, to start acting like a team. The thing that struck me when I got all these responses is that to most of the VMS engineers, this is more than just a job. This is something that they are very passionate about and they care very much about the work that they're doing and they care very much about doing it right. And I think a very striking example of that is what happened a few years ago when VSI was formed. And several of the engineers that VSI had on their hiring list were people who had retired. People like Claire who had taken up golf. And they called these people and they were expecting them to say, well, I need to think about that, I need to talk to my wife about it first. But most of these people said, yes, when can I start? And I don't think they would have done that if the job had not involved working on Open VMS. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Richard? So, Part of that is that OpenVMS has a very strong developer user community. There are events like these where there's a lot of communication between the developers and the users. Outside of events like this, there's also some of that communication going over things like quick cases and VMS engineering actually, you, if you have a complicated problem, by the time it gets to level three support, there may actually be some real contact between you and the engineer who's working on your problem. Because it really matters to them that they understand what the problem is you're experiencing so that their fix is going to work for you. And I think this is sort of like a positive feedback loop. These engineers 
care a lot about their job, and that encourages them to have that dialogue with, their, with the user community. At the same time, having that contact with the user community gives our engineers a real feel of how important OpenVMS is in the user community. And I think that that reinforces the passion that we have in working on this project, on these products. Um, so that's something that's very important. Don't keep your engineers away from the end users of the product. Experienced engineers. In a lot of engineering organizations, you'll have a few experienced engineers at the top and a lot of fresh hires doing a lot of the grunt work under those few people at the top. VMS engineering is pretty much the other way around. We have a whole lot of very experienced engineers and a few newcomers who are sort of apprentices. And what that means is that we have a huge experience or, 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 or a huge opportunity for these new hires to be mentored by the old timers, so to speak. And when I joined VSI a year ago, I knew a fair bit about coding, and of course I knew the architectures we were working with, and I knew something about the internals of VMS, but there were also a lot of things I knew nothing about, like how the VDE works, the VMS development environment, which is where we check out our code and do check-ins and code reviews, things like that. I had no idea how any of that worked, but I found that there were experienced engineers who were willing to sit down with me in my cubicle for a few hours and show me the, how, how that worked. And there's a lot of things like that. Um, when you're making your first code change, it's very helpful if someone points out to you, in my case, well, I see what you've done. You didn't like how the code was written, how it was laid out. And I agree with you. This was Doug Gordon. I see him laughing in the back of the room. There was a bit of code that I worked on that was a bit of a mess. So I had gone in, and everything I didn't like about how it was written, I fixed. So curly braces, moved them around to where I thought they should be, which is at the end of the line that has the if statement. No, no. So when I had this code ready to, to check in, um, I gave it to, to Doug to, to have a quick look over. And he's like, well, I'm willing to let you get, a, get by with it this time, but you really shouldn't do that because when I'm reviewing something, I'm looking at differences between the original file and the new file. Now you've made all these changes that are cosmetic, and I have to look at all of them rather than just the changes that fix the bug you were after. And I, well, and I still had to make another code change, so I quickly went back in and reverted all that and only put in the code changes that were needed. But he, I did not get a smack on the head. I got a very good explanation of why it was not such a great idea I had. And that's what some of this is all about. What we also have in our engineering team are recognized experts in pretty much all areas. I know that if I'm dealing with something and I run into something in SDA that I don't understand, Richard's the guy I go to. If I run into something around the file system, I can go to Andy. But these experts are not immune to criticism. If Andy is working on his new file system design, and I were to have a look over what he's doing and figure out something that I think may not be working correctly and point it out to him, Andy's not going to tell me, well, I'm the expert on file systems, shut up. He's going to seriously look into what I said, and if I'm wrong, he's going to explain to me why I'm wrong, and if I'm right, we found a bug. This has not happened. 
it will be nice if something like that happens, but uh, so, but this is very important. And I've been in other engineering organizations where this did not work, did not work that way. I would point out we have had our prima donnas in the NSA. We've had them. Let me tell you. Not always be that nice. In our current company, we have a hiring policy, and it's called the no jerk policy. If you are the kind of prima donna who doesn't take criticism well, we will not hire you. The problem with it is, if I'm an inexperienced engineer, and I go into a meeting and there's this prima donna explaining something, and I have some sort of criticism of something, and maybe I didn't understand it correctly, very well possible. But if I speak out, and I immediately get smacked on the head, I'm not going to speak up again next time. And the next time, I may do have a valid contribution to make. But I'm not going to speak out because I think, well, I know what the consequences of that are. And maybe a bug makes its way into a product that gets shipped. So you can't really have any behavior like that in a real good engineering team. Um, of course, to a certain extent, a lot of software engineers are very proud of the work they, they do. They take ownership of it, but that should not interfere with other people's abilities to make contributions. We're also a very informal organization. We have very short communication lines. Doors to offices are pretty much always open, and no problem walking into Claire's office to discuss something, or walking into Eddie's office to discuss something. And that's also important. If you have all these management layers, ultimately no one is responsible. And having people take responsibility for what they do, it's important that your team doesn't get too formal and rigid in structure. So, the design of OpenVMS is well thought out from day one. They didn't start sitting at a VT100 writing code for a processor that didn't exist yet. They started out designing an operating system in tandem with a computer that didn't exist yet. And security, which was early on identified as one of the key qualifiers of this new operating system, was designed in from the very beginning. So if you're working on a software project, or if you're about to embark on a software project, I would advise you to find out what are the properties of my product going to be. And if one of those properties is security, for instance, or if it's scalability, make that part of your design from day one. Keep that in mind as you develop your design, because adding things like that later, it becomes a thin veneer over a product that really doesn't have offer that. So quality must be designed in at the start. It can't be added later. By the time they found out that the Tower of Pisa was toppling over slowly, it was too late to put in a more sturdy foundation. But even quality software can erode if care is not observed continuously. You want to keep in mind what the quality of the product, what it needs to be as you continue working on a product. If you lose sight of that, it's going to harm everything. So you want to keep that in mind. Documentation, um, I quite like this quote, you are not expected to under understand this from one of the early versions of Bell Unix. Um, it's not as bad as it looks. There's actually a fairly detailed explanation of what's going on in the source code comments. It's just if you can't follow that, then you're not supposed to understand it. And we have places like that in VMS, believe me. Um, so documentation begins with a good design specification. 
that's the starting point for all documentation. You really want to capture all the essential bits and pieces of what you're going to do in your design specification. The next level of documentation gets put into the code. So in your design specification, you describe the problem you're solving and an outline of how you're going to solve it. In the code, you're going to want to document why it was done the way it was done. It may be that you come up with a design and there's an intuitive way to implement it. You implement it in that intuitive way, you find out it doesn't work for some very obscure reason that you didn't think of when you came up with the intuitive idea. You rewrite the code to be much more complex and you leave it like that. Now if you don't document that you've done that, the next person who works on the code, and it may be you 20 years from now, is going to look at this and think, this is horribly complicated code. It doesn't need to be that way. There's an intuitive solution to this. And they take out the carefully crafted code, put in something that you knew 20 years ago was not going to work. So you want to put a comment in there that says, I know it looks easy. It, it, the intuitive way would be to do it this way, but you really want to trust me to do it this way because of this and this and this. If you don't understand why, please don't mess with this code. Um, we also have note conferences that were used a lot to discuss ideas. Um, the current incarnation of that seemed to be wikis. Um, wiki pages that everyone can edit and add IDs onto. And I find that um, currently a lot of documentation ends up being sent in the form of emails. Email discussions back and forth about how to implement a certain thing, in my mind, are part of documentation. So when I'm working on several projects, I have an email folder for each of those projects. And every email that I receive and every email that I send that's remotely connected to one of these projects gets put into these folders. Those folders get archived. And some of these folders, like the Java 8 folder, has a ton of emails in it. But if I ever want to come back two years from now and figure out why we made a certain decision today, I can go back. And it may be a long search before I find the particular emails that pertain to that decision, but at least it's still there. So keep that in mind when you're deleting emails about stuff that you fixed. You may want to look at some of that stuff later. Well, this is one of the things. This is like a personal documentation. It's a very good point. One should have the discipline to document all the really relevant decisions elsewhere in a place where it's publicly accessible. Reality is that that doesn't always happen. And saving those emails is a partial backup strategy to, to doing it completely the way it should be done, I would say. And of course, on VMS, we have a very special level of documentation. We have the Internals and Data Structures Manual. And I know that not every software project is going to have something like that. But to me, in learning to understand how VMS works, the IDSM has been invaluable. Because it takes you from the broad perspective of this is what the operating system does, down to a level that's pretty close to the actual code. And it's publicly available, and if there's one thing I would love to do after we finish the x86 board is update the IDSM to reflect that. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but I'd love to be involved in that. Um, so that brings me to the workflow. I love deadlines. I like the whooshing sound they make as they fly by. <laughs> that happens a lot. 
So this is our basic workflow. We start with a problem statement that leads to a design. The design leads to a prototype, although that sometimes can be skipped. After prototyping, we implement a solution that gets tested, documented, and it gets, gets released, ultimately. And through this entire process, there's a very strong focus on quality in all stages of this work. So the problem statement, you really want to capture as much detail as possible. We don't need to know the color of the box the CPU came in, but pretty much everything else about your problem we do want to know. And if you think of, for instance, writing a piece of business software, what you want to know as a programmer or as a software engineer before you start developing something like this, is you really want to understand the business process that this software is supposed to help with. So I find when I was writing software like that, I found it very valuable to have interview sessions with various people in the company who used different parts of what was going to be the software I was going to write. And just capture as much detail as possible of what does your job entail, who do you communicate with, where do the results go, what happens if there's a hiccup, say this colleague has gotten ill and you can't get the results you want in time, what do you do then? Capture all that kind of detail. And whether you're writing a business application where you're going to capture the detail of what the users are going to do with the application, or if you're trying to tr solve a bug, you want to figure out as much detail as possible because you can always leave out detail in your design if you found out it's not relevant, but it's much easier to collect everything up front than to go back later and ask for more information. So, the design. We typically write a design specification, and if a problem is moderately complex, the design specification may list multiple approaches to the problem. When the design specification is ready, there's go it's going to be reviewed. And a design review may simply be one engineer walking over to another engineer asking, do you have some time to go over a design? And just sitting together for half an hour or an hour going over the design saying, yes, it looks sound, let's go for it. But if it's a complicated design, like the design for the Swiss abstraction layer that I'm currently working on for x86, the review is going to be a bit more involved than that. It's going to be a review committee or a review meeting with several people in the room. They'll each have had a lot of time to read the design, to try and come up with holes in the design. And the whole idea of this is that by the time that everyone on a committee like that is convinced that the design is sound and solid, it's likely to be close to that. Whereas if the design was written by a single person and not checked by, everyone, by anyone else, you develop a kind of blindness and you don't see some of the things that you should have seen and other people who are fresh to your design will see it. So we do a design, we have a design review and some things come up that are not quite wrong or not quite right. So one of my colleagues may ask, well, what would happen if a non-maskable interrupt were to come in between where this happens and that, ha that happens? And my response may be, well, I've thought of that and what would happen is this and this and this and therefore it's all right. And my colleague may say, well, but what if then this also happens? And I may think, I didn't quite think of that possibility. And you're maybe right, there may be a hole there. So then I go back to the drawing board and I come back with a new revision of the design. And we reiterate this until we're satisfied that the design is solid. 
one of the things that this helps with is ultimately this saves time in a complex project. It may not look that way, but if my design has a problem, I may be able to fix it in a day when the design is still a design. If I find that problem after I've written 99% of the code, my instinct would be to look for a small change to fix the problem I'm seeing, whereas the real solution to the problem I'm seeing may be a complete rewrite of a part of the design. You're not likely to do that when 99% of the code is complete, and even if you do it at that point, rewriting your code is never fun, which is one of the reasons we also do prototypes. So if we have something complicated like running in two modes, we build a prototype and it may not do everything that the finished product is going to do, but it's going to do enough of it to give us the confirmation we need that the parts that were really difficult to figure out during the design phase are in fact going to work. The other thing a prototype will give us is test cases, because during prototyping, we'll find certain cases where the behavior is different from what we were expecting. And you can fix that. But you should keep those corner conditions and use them as test cases to run against the final product. Because everything you find that way is a bug that may have made it into the final product and you don't want the customers finding bugs. You want you to find most bugs before a product goes out the door. And there will be, sometimes we'll have a meeting to discuss the, the results of some prototyping. Sometimes the prototyping didn't quite work the way we thought it would and we probably maybe have some good reasons why it didn't. That may be a reason to review the design again. It may be a reason to do another round of prototyping. Or the conclusion can be we can now go and write the actual code. So when we start implementing code, sometimes you can use that prototype as a basis to start from. If something's really complicated, sometimes you don't want to do that. Because by the time you've got your prototype to the point where you want it to be, you may have ended up with some pretty convoluted code to work around certain problems. And you may be able to make your code a lot cleaner and a lot easier to maintain by rewriting it from scratch. But that's not going to take as much time as it did before, because now you pretty much know what you're going to do. And writing clean code when you know what you're doing, when you know that your design is working, is a lot easier than writing clean code in a trial and error fashion. So, once the code is ready, it will be reviewed. And, again, it depends. If it's a very simple few lines change to make a certain field a little bit wider in a display function, there's not going to be a big committee to review that change. But, if it's something complicated, there's going to be a group of people who are going to look over the source code, they're going to compare it to the design specification, and they're going to see, is there anything in here that we missed? Is there anything in here that doesn't look quite right? And they'll start asking questions of whoever wrote the code to explain certain bits of it. They may request that they put in some extra comments to clarify something that may have been perfectly clear to the guy who wrote it, but was not instantly clear to the people who reviewed the code. So this really helps to keep the quality of the code conforming to a very high standard. So once this has happened, the code gets checked in. And the programmer will also come up with some unit tests. 
And those will be handed over to quality test and verification. And those unit tests will be incorporated into a much larger set of tests that QTV has and that they run pretty much continuously. And I'll get into that later. So you write some tests and rather than only running them after you've developed the product, it gets integrated into the standard tests that we run every time. That means that if there's going to be a problem because someone has modified some code that interoperates with your code, you're more likely to find it. Um, also important when it comes to testing, everything we say we support, we test it. We don't take a customer's word that say, we've run it, it works great, for granted, and say, we support this. We want to see those test results, and we want to be able to replicate those tests before we say we support something. And I'll get back to continuous testing a little bit later. So after that, it's time to get out the customer documentation. So a description of the changes and a description of what needs to change in the documentation gets handed off to the documentation team. The documentation team incorporates those changes into the user documentation. And there's a reason that the engineers don't write the documentation themselves. And the reason for that is that technical writing is something different from software engineering. As a software engineer, when you're writing your design, of course, there's a certain amount of technical writing involved there. But it's the, that's the kind of technical writing that's directed at your peers who have the same, more or less the same level of knowledge of the internals of the operating system as you do. Writing documentation that goes out to customers who come at this with a very different set of knowledge is something else. So you want to have very good, dedicated people who write and maintain the documentation because they'll do a much better job at making it understandable for the poor system manager who now has to work with this. And of course, after they've written the documentation, the documentation needs to be reviewed. And at the very least, the original developer who wrote the code will need to sign off that, yes, this accurately describes what has changed. So then you'd say, it's now time to release this code. Well, there's one more hurdle. The release manager. The release manager is ultimately responsible for what does or does not get shipped. They need to sign off on this code change before it makes it into the product that actually gets shipped. And then we have a team of builders who manage all of our different code streams. So we have a, um, a code repository that has various streams in it. So for example, we'll have a stream for the next version that we're currently working on. We'll have a stream for remedial fixes to the previous version and for the prior to previous version. We we'll may have a, well, currently we have a stream for x86 development work. That's a stream that's not going to be in the next release. It's going to be in some release somewhere in the future. So managing these streams, we have a team of builders who are responsible for controlling what goes into that source repository and where it goes. And they're responsible for replicating code changes from one change, one stream to another if needed. They're responsible for creating new streams when they're needed and for basically closing access to streams when a release goes out the door and we now no longer change this. So, with that, um, that's pretty much the workflow as we, we follow it. Um, and there's one thing that I still need to talk about, and that's continuous testing. Um, 
I just had to put this quote in there because it's my absolute favorite quote, computer science related. On two occasions, I have been asked, pray, Mr. Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers still come out? I'm not able rightly to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. A quote from Charles Babbage. And um, so, continuous testing. Are operating systems, utilities, layered products, compilers, are pretty much all built from scratch weekly from the latest sources? Not always exactly or exactly weekly, but more or less we, we, we try to follow that. And whatever gets built, unless the build breaks, in which case there's nothing that gets built. Uh, if the build breaks, by the way, um, the programmer who caused the build to break will learn of it. And um, this is a matter of minor disgrace. So they'll do their best to fix the build so that the team of builders can actually do a build again. And the weekly build may be, may be delayed by a few days because of that. So you don't want this to happen. Uh, I don't think I have broken the build yet, but uh, I'm sure it's going to happen sometime in the future. So please be gentle with me. Um, this weekly build, when it's done, gets installed on a whole number of servers. So we've got test clusters, large systems, small systems, systems connected to all sorts of storage. And this new build of the operating system gets installed there. Regression tests get run on them. So even if we're now we're working, for instance, on version 8.5, we don't wait until all the code changes for 8.5 are in and then start testing the products. We start testing the first code changes for 8.5 as soon as the first code changes for 8.5 are committed to the repository. And because of that, you find, you tend to find a lot of problems very quickly after making the code change which is a lot better than finding out after six months, now we have all the code complete, we're going to test it. There's a big problem in something you wrote six months ago. It's much nicer to know in a few days. Um, some of these builds make it all the way to our development systems, which now means they get used when we compile code they get used when we check out code, they get used when we make code changes. So we're now working on these um, weekly builds. We've got our developers working on it, which means it's got a pretty decent day-to-day -day workout being in actual use, which is kind of valuable. And this is not applicable to all kinds of um, application development, of course. Um, imagine you're writing an airline reservation system as a software house. You don't really get to test that on a day-to-day -day basis in your own company because simply you're not an airline. You may be able to use a large portion of your code base, however, in that case, to and use it and build like a meeting room reservation on top of it or a company car reservation system. And that way, you will get to at least test some portion of your code in day-to-day -day use in your own company. Try to find a creative way to use a large portion of the code you're developing in within your own company. Um, so that brings me to the conclusion. And one of the things to bear in mind is that I wrote this conclusion uh, before VSI was formed. And um, it may be a little bit dark, but I think 
we have been incredibly lucky that a company like VSI was formed to take VMS software. Other projects may not be this fortunate. So I think that this still applies in a larger sense. So a lot of the recommendations can be summed up as maintain a high standard of work at all times. Really make sure that quality is first most in focus, whatever phase of the project you're working on. And a lot of that basically is grounded in maintaining a proper engineering culture. But that doesn't happen by itself. It needs to be cultivated and it needs to be maintained. And that requires a lot of support from management. If the management team in a company does not understand how these processes work, they're going to pressure a team into deadlines they cannot meet. They're going to make their lives miserable and it's going to lead to the breakdown of the team. Because even though a well-working team like this strengthens itself and builds up a remarkable resilience, too many poor management decisions may eventually lead to even the strongest team breaking down. So with that, I'm going to leave you, and if there are any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes? Agile development. Yes. Um, what we are doing is very definitely not agile development. And I think agile development has its place. I don't necessarily think is it has its place in any sort of mission critical development. The whole idea behind agile development is continuously trying to get something to the state where it's just good enough to get by with. And that's very much not the mentality that we develop over the VMS with. And I think it's it's probably fine for, for applications that are not really critical to your business. But one of the things, of course, that, that um, well, one of the examples that happened, I think, about a year ago was there was, I don't have all the details present. I, there's, there's this website that has this whole collection of little routines that other websites can use in their website building process. And one of the guys who developed some of the routines for this website was not happy with some kind of policy change they enacted, and he pulled his code from that server. One of the pieces of code on that server that this guy wrote was a simple, I think it was a left trim function to trim the spaces on the left side of a string from it. And because this guy pulled this very trivial piece of code from that website, hundreds of websites worldwide ceased functioning, including some websites from very well-respected brands who really needed their website for their business. And I don't necessarily think that that's the right way to, to set up such a website. So there are risks, risks involved in the whole agile development methodology and you need to be aware of that and you need to, if the job doesn't require this kind of well thought out design, the only reason I can see for, for something not requiring that if it, is if it's not critical to your business. Anyone else? Thank you for your attention, and uh, you can all enjoy a 10-minute break before your next session.